The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Giving a voice to the voiceless, pulling stories out of the shadows and putting them under the spotlight, making sure that each person is valued and cared for. This is Humanity First with Peter Evers, presented by BAMZ. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Humanity First. It's been a couple of weeks since we've chatted, uh, but today we're going to address an issue that's very much in the news. Uh, recently, over the last week or so, we had the vice presidential debate, and what was on a lot of minds was how this discussion around uh, immigration was going to go, and it was front and center, and there was an awful lot of uh, talk uh, that ended up being quite negative about uh, the the people who come to this country, which in some ways is quite strange. I am an immigrant myself. My journey was a very easy one. But today we're actually going to have on the show uh, uh, Richard Negrini, uh, who is a behavioral anal uh, analyst um, with BAMSI, uh, where I work. Uh, and his journey began in Kenya. Uh, and his journey to America began around about the year 2000 when he arrived in this country with um, a place at a local university to do an MBA uh, and $300 in his pocket. Uh, and really, I thought it was important to have Richard on this show to show the actual face of the people who come to America from all over the world. And those stories are fascinating because they're stories of hope and they're stories of determination and they're stories of success as well, as much woven into the fabric of American culture as anyone else who came to these countries from foreign shores, remembering that there are very few original Americans. And of course, those are Native Americans. This country is built on the idea of acceptance of people from everywhere and the building of a culture of belonging and the building of a culture of inclusion and to have it under a, under attack for political gain, which is, which is really what is happening at the expense of a group of people, Haitian people in this particular case, who have been vilified uh, due to the idea of getting political points by making up stories that, that benefit one political side is appalling. And it is also very hurtful and hurtful in terms of life-threateningly hurtful, uh, as you have heard. So we'll hear from Richard when we come back. Um, uh, it is a wonderful story. We'll be right back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm an essential worker here at BAMSI, and I'm a nurse. Nurses are essential here at BAMZ because as nurses, we really have the opportunity to make an impact. We have very small ratios, so we have the opportunity to really learn everything about the person served and be able to give the best care. It really serves such a great purpose for me as being a nurse and really why I came into nursing. Learn more about nursing opportunities at BAMZjobs.org. Giving a voice to the voiceless, pulling stories out of the shadows and putting them under the spotlight, making sure that each person is valued and cared for. This is Humanity First with Peter Evers, presented by BAMZ. Welcome back, everybody, to Humanity First. And as promised in the uh, in the in the monologue, we have Richard Negrini with us. Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Hi, I'm well, Peter. Good and I, you again. as I said before, uh, Richard is a behavioral analyst here at BAMZ. Um, and somebody who works on the clinical side um, with us, with our person served. Um, but Richard has a, uh, a story uh, and Richard has um, a journey that we're going to explore a little bit today. But, you know, Rich, uh, Richard, maybe I'd, I'd like to start with what's going on at the moment today. It is really difficult to avoid uh, for anybody in this country the loggerheads that we're at politically. And as with every, it seems to me with every um, election cycle, the issue of immigration comes up as uh, a wedge issue between the two parties, not even between the two parties, between all Americans, really. Um, and it becomes a wedge issue. And as it becomes a wedge issue, it becomes an issue that really, in some ways, in, in my opinion, puts people in danger. So let's take what happened um, with and I'm not going to name parties because we're not uh, we're not um, we're not going to take sides on this. But one of the parties identified a place uh, in Springfield, Field, Ohio, where um, where Haitian immigrants were uh, allegedly eating pets, 
Um, this, of course, uh, after you know much investigation, even by the the right and the left, uh, proved not to be true. But that narrative lives on. That point of difference lives on. Richard, as an immigrant, and we both are, and both of our journeys have been our journeys have been very different. But as an immigrant from Kenya, I'm going to put this to you. Um, regardless of one's status as an immigrant, whether you have um, the right uh, papers or not, um, is this a dangerous time to be an immigrant in this country? It is a very difficult time, and uh, Peter, thanks for having me here. And uh, obviously mine is, is just a small voice in addition to many other voices. But I'm bold to say that it, it is a difficult time to be in America right now uh, it is a difficult time for immigrants to be here because of the things that you hear said and when you know the power that lies in words. So it turns out, like during the Second World War, that um, in, in this country, which is not a long time ago, mm -hmm. 120,000 Japanese people are forced into camps. Mm -hmm. And there were people from all walks of life. There were Americans, doctors, lawyers, business people. Um, if you look, even in, uh, if you go back into Germany, the the people who are forced into camps, they were also, you know, uh, the Jewish people. Finally, they came for the Jewish people, but they had eliminated other Germans who were quote unquote undesirable mm -hmm. until they go to the Germans, and by the time all was said and done, six million Jews were dead, mm -hmm. and they were doctors, lawyers, business people, people from all walks of life. So when we talk about, you know, that people are eating cats and eating dogs, we don't, I don't think we, as immigrants, we are here to try and, f you know, fight hatred with hatred, but to say that hatred has power. And hatred from the words of hatred then, you know, comes action. So that people then, they start to fear what could happen to them. And, um, and for me, so I would say that um, a lot of immigrants I cannot speak for all of them because I know there are many immigrants, even of color, that support even the other side of the of the equation. But um, but there are very many immigrants that are really, really terrified of right. what's going to happen to them, to their families, to their loved ones. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And Richard, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that um, people come to America for all sorts of reasons. You know, I came because I had the opportunity to uh, make a different life. Many, um, many people come to this country because they're running away from something. Oftentimes they're running away from something um, that has been uh, undemocratic, that has been um, violent towards another group of people, uh, another tribe, for instance. Um, I would imagine that puts that into even more relief when people who are running from a regime that has been violent, uh, that has been murderous, uh, are coming to a place where people are being singled out. Uh, that must have a very different feeling, right? It is. It is. And I, and I just want to say, I think that um, migration is as old as humanity. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it turns out that we are not the first people to be on the move. Uh, you came here because of me. They felt that you had something to give. And I personally came here also to pursue an education. I came here, you know, to make a difference, but also the symbol, just when wherever you see the American flag fly, whether it's in America, whether it's in other parts of the world, it's a symbol of hope. It's a symbol, an idea that people can live as free people, that you can pursue your God-given abilities and actually make a difference to your own life and make a difference to the lives of other people. Now, when when uh, the, the reason that brings you to America, so some people come here running away from violence, some people come here running away from all sorts of difficult situations, and other people just come because obviously there's more opportunity here. But um, the, I, I would say for myself that when you get here, when most people get to America, most people will, even if they don't speak it, I, I, let me say for myself. So I went to school. My first classroom where I went to school was a mud thatched, mud, mm. mud walled, grass thatched, a little building with no lights and maybe like two windows. Right. 
and uh, we shared a desk with four other children. Mm -hmm. What you see on TV, you know, when children are depicted and saying, you know, donate desks, that's what I went to mm -hmm. school. That, that's why I went to school. And I would say there was always, you know, this plane that flew over our home. And I, I used to tell my mother, I, I know, I know that one day I will be able to do that. And uh, so I, I came to America. The coming to America for me is a fulfillment of just a life that, that yes, I can be able to achieve something important. And I, I remember when I was coming to America, my mother said, you know, I hope the doors open for you. And literally when I got to like JFK, because that's where I landed, mm -hmm. you know how the doors here, they have like this slide automatically. I'm like my mother's <laughs> dreams came, my mother's prayers came true. So kind of that it is actually for many people, they are coming to America or they are living wherever they are living with, because of whatever has happened to them and that despair and that loss of hope. And they get here and finally, finally, yeah. finally, yes, we can hope again. Yes, we can dream again. Yes. yes, we can have a life that is worth living. Yeah. yeah, You know, I totally agree with you. And I felt the same way. Uh, again, my story is, of, of course, completely different. But the hope um, and the feeling that anything is possible was something that really drew me uh, towards this country. And I remember, I remember, and of course, you know, this is way before 9-11, but I remember coming to New York for the first time and seeing those twin towers and, and thinking they yeah. were almost like a magnet that was drawing in people, a place where you could fulfill your full potential. And I totally still believe in that, which actually puts this in even starker uh, relief to me that as as a society that is built on immigration, there are uh, there are very few original Americans, right? If we think about yes. it, uh, we are all uh, from another land except from for uh, uh, the found the original uh, Native Americans. Um, it throws it into even more sort of contrast that we're distinguishing now in a way that is almost people seeing people as subhuman. And you said something right at the beginning, at the top of the of the discussion, that, and you, you sort of referenced the Second World War and you re referenced what happened there. So you see this, you come to this country, you have this hope and, and you have this uh, feeling that if I work hard, I can really do well. Some of those things are under attack right now. Um, what... What do we have to do to get back to a place? Or, or, or in fact, are we, are we overblowing this at the moment? Are we, are we in a situation where, we'll, where things will level out? But I just worry that the common the conventional wisdom is to set people against each other, which was not the case when I first came here 32 years ago. So I would say that what is happening here, I do not believe at all it's unique to america what is unique what is unique is actually the time in which is happening because some many people sometimes believe that with progress that you it's you're unlikely to go back but it's actually very because of hatred and like i was you know told you before hatred is like you know how in your yard you know you will go to bed at night and one day you wake up and the whole place ha is full of mushrooms and unbeknown to you they've been you know like planting the seed and mm. perinating all through and mm. one day they just rise up that what has happened here in america what is happening here in america has happened in bosnia has happened in rwanda has happened in you know uh, of course germany is the classic case but even you go as far back in history when the jews were mm. in egypt the yeah. same thing happened exactly. that in fact that hatred never really dies Hatred is like a tree stump that just sits there and you think you've cut it down, but it has this just an endurance, an ability to continue to grow. And even when you're not seeing it, until then it is completely visible. And especially when it is given light and when it is given, you know, just air permission. and there's permission to yeah. grow. So I think that what is now happening in America and people need to understand I have a, I, my pastor in, a, in a, a previous church used to say that the words that you speak, that they fall to the ground and weave themselves into a garment. And that's the garment that you wear. Mm -hmm. And truly today, mm -hmm. I would want to say that there are many of our brothers and our sisters in this country who have accepted the words of hatred, 
accepting the words of fear. They are going to eat your dogs. They are going to eat your cats. They are, you know, taking your jobs. They are other. And, and when that happens, I think then you now feel in your heart, especially there is a lot of mental health issues in this country. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you make people who are already struggling and living on the margins already start to fear and to hate, then you put into motion things that you can no longer control. Yeah. So I think people should, should feel right to be afraid and for America. But also to fight it, right? To fight back against that. And I often find um, I'm throughout my life, I sort of live by the creed of, of, of appreciative inquiry, this notion of getting to know people, getting to know people's stories. Yes. Um, and getting the, to know the story of, uh, of immigrants, of new Americans, is always fascinating because there is always a story. Your story is fascinating as well. I know, you, I know we sort of touched on it a little bit but reasonably typical, right, of somebody who's coming from the continent of Africa, from Kenya in your, in your case, but this idea of arriving on a distant shore with very little and a very uh, clear idea about what, about what you want to tell us a little bit about that story. So my, my American journey starts obviously going to the embassy to get that visa. And for just anybody knows, even then, this is 2000, was not easy to get a visa. And then, you know, then I came to go to school to study for an MBA. And I got here on September 5th, 2000, so 24 years ago. And uh, I got here with tuition paid for one semester to go to Johnson & Wales and $300 in my pocket. That's exactly what I had. So just, you know, from that $300, I have now um, two homes. I own two homes in Rhode Island. And how did I do it? So for me... I started, my first, very first job was as a mental health assistant. And this is something I was going to do to um, help pay for school, to help pay my tuition. And I remember my first day at work being uh, directed into a bathroom. And my job was to actually give this Caucasian man with uh, mental health issues, intellectually disabled, a bath. And I'm looking at this person. I've never given a bath to any other human being before. And now here we are. And um, looks very different. Never done this before. But it turns out that at his core, even with his disability and his challenges, he's a very good human being. Mm -hmm. And it, this, it, that I could also care for him. And now from then on, I never looked back. So I, I actually pursued, I finished my MBA. I could not get a job. I could not, and I continued to work in human service. I could not get a job in business. I continued to work in human services. And as I worked in human services, I, I ended up in an agency where I learned that I could actually do five uh, college classes, five college level, master's level classes, and become a behavior analyst. But I could not actually enroll in this class truthfully because of discrimination. And it took the courage to go to the uh, EEOC, those of you who don't know mm -hmm. what that is, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And because of that, I was able to enroll for the class. And I, I was, and because of how much I needed it, I actually secured all A's in my class and passed for the exam, I passed the exam to become a behavior analyst. And here we are today. So it's not been an easy journey, but it has been ex extremely rewarding. And I would not look back because every day I wake up to take care of American citizens, all of them. Every person that I take care of is an American citizen. And now I take care of them as a clinician, but I have, you know, any day I will go shower, I'll go clean, I'll go cook, I'll do whatever it takes. Because at the core, whether you're immigrant, whether you're an American, whether you're white, whether you're ch from China, at the core is that value for humanity. And can we really truly care for one another? That's, I think that's all that matters. And that's really my journey. Yeah, yeah. Is, well, what a wonderful story. Yeah. And, you know, one, as I said before, the, the more we know, the harder it is to hate in terms of us of, as, as human beings, uh, whoever we are. Um, we were very lucky that you managed to prevail, that you managed to get those courses and uh, and we're very lucky that you ended up at BAMSI. We're also very lucky that you've come and you've told us the story because it shows, sheds a lot of light on what's going on at the moment. Richard, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you, Peter. Bye, thank everybody. You, thank you, thank you, thank you.